our next speaker, I'm very excited about. Uh, he's been looking at how organizations need to move to be more responsive. Um, I actually think if you were here this morning and you were listening to Tim speak about how uh, cities are sort of reshaping themselves around technology, um, a lot of what Aaron Dignan from Undercurrent is looking at is how are organizations reshaping themselves around technology. Um, I realized uh, right before I came up here that I've gone through the entire day without a single McLuhan quote, and that seemed just sort of immoral. Um, and so uh, I, I was sort of thinking about Aaron's talk, and I think ultimately it sort of summed up nicely with this one of my favorite McLuhan quotes, which is that uh, we shape our tools and thereafter our sh tools shape us. Um, and I think really a lot of what Aaron is going to talk about is sort of how are organizations changing as we learn more about technology and learn more about the impact that it has and, and how do we build an organization for the future. So um, please join me in welcoming Aaron Dignan from Undercurrent. Hi. So uh, I'm going to try to give everyone some time back. Magic. So uh, basically, what I wanted to try to do is what we do every day at Undercurrent, which is try to make a little bit of sense about all the various topics that we've heard so far today. And I've been lucky to be in the audience for a lot of them, so I've been noticing these patterns. But essentially, where we start is observing and seeing what's happening, and then can we unpack why that is and where we might be headed. And so. The first place that I want to begin is just this reality that we all live in now, and none of this is news to anybody in the room, but this idea that it is much, much, much easier today than 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago to do two things. One, bring an idea to life, and two, to bring that idea or that product when it's manifest to scale. And so today we saw even in the economies of scale between somebody inventing a Tesla and the next generation of you know, lit motors, or if you look at what's happened in, you know, in the tool space, if you look at the time to reaching scale among some of our most popular tools, whether it be an Instagram or a Facebook or an Uber or whatever it might be, it just keeps getting compressed and compressed and compressed. And so now a kid in a garage can you know, not be able to afford a 3D printer, spend some time with their friends, use the internet, and you know, a year later, be the founder of MakerBot. Like, we just live in that world where you can bring an idea to life, you can use Kickstarter, you can fund it, you can collaborate, you can use all the tools that are available to us. And because you can do that, it sort of changes the world around us in some really interesting and profound ways. So assuming that you buy this, that it's easier to bring it to life, and that it's easier to bring it to scale, one of the questions is why. So what's, what's sort of the underpinning of, of these two ideas? And there's actually just a pretty simple model for that. One is this idea of platforms. So almost every company that we think of now that's building is building on the shoulders of the people that came before them. You know, when you launch a tool now and you have your whole back-end cloud architecture and infrastructure, you're, you might be leveraging you know, Amazon Web Services. So you now are 10 days out of you know, past funding, and you're using this robust, rich, scalable, amazing open architecture or you know, any of their competitors that are all available to you because someone else did the work of building that and now you can, you can leverage it. And the platforms are you know, multivariate and you know, all over the place, whether it be using YouTube as a content channel, using a technology, using you know, infrastructure around mobile, using even an you know, API or a build tool or you know, a prototyping tool. They're all available because some other business created something and then either open sourced it to the world or made that their product, or let that exhaust be something that you could start to tap into. So the idea of the platform is a pretty important enabler. And the second is this idea of networks, which I know Noah is a big fan of talking about and thinking about, pontificating on. And the big thing with networks is that once the groundwork is done, once the track is laid, you can then run things over it with a lot more speed. Things can reach folks with a, with a speed that was unprecedented before. So if I have a great video, if I have a great piece of content, if I have a great idea, if I have a Kickstarter campaign to create potato salad, that, see there's some people that read the news, um, then that can reach millions and millions of people through the network. Or if I have an app idea that's really bright, that app idea can transmit across the network and be downloaded a million times or a hundred million times. And so the fact that networks are being built all the time and that different businesses are in the process of simultaneously leveraging and building upon platforms and networks as well as creating the next for the people that will come after them is creating this climate of rapid innovation. So an example 
you know, you take Uber, for instance. They didn't have to invent the mobile phone. They didn't have to invent GPS. They didn't have to invent the iOS app store. They didn't have to invent the luxury sedan. They didn't have to invent the livery. They didn't have to invent 99% of the stack of value that they're actually providing to the end user. They just got to do that thin layer of icing, which was how do you knit together this collection of vehicles and users into a network and make it work, make it sing. And the same thing's true for a lot of the other big network models like an Airbnb. So they're able to do that at the same time because they're building that network, someone else could come in and start to think about how do I market to that network? How do I leverage that network? How do I offer, you know, they just partnered with some vehicle manufacturers who said, hey, we're gonna offer cars at a discount with a better financing option. To, to that audience, so that goes on. And then Tesla, a little bit more of an uphill battle because there's not as much to leverage, but they're certainly leveraging battery technology. They're certainly leveraging and building upon it. They're leveraging uh, OSs, so they have a Linux-based you know, Ubuntu OS behind that 17-inch screen in the dash, so they're not rewriting OS from scratch. So they're leveraging platforms, and at the same time, they're building networks. The whole idea of a long-distance you know, supercharger network was not real and is now starting to become real. And by opening their IP and allowing any manufacturer to build a charging compatibility with that network, now technically anybody with an electric car could, could borrow that and treat it as a platform. So that's just a little bit of, of background. Now there's a couple things that have happened in the world as a result of this. The first is that it's much, much harder to stay at the top of the heap. Things are changing so quickly and there's so much pressure from that lift of people leveraging other people's IP and ideas and, and understanding that now basically what you have is, in 1960 or so, the, uh, the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company was about 60 years. So if you're on the list, you probably have a 60 year run. And you start to sort of fast forward and you see some different dips, but you end up in a world where by 2025, 2030, that number is more like 12 to 15 years. So a dramatic cut in your ability to stay at the top because of all this pressure, all this change that's going on. So that's one thing you have to grapple with. And if you're a small company and you have the right kind of systems, maybe you can grapple with that. But if you're a big company with hundreds of thousands of employees and you're trying to do 40 products in 40 countries, the need to change at this rate and to sort of fight against these forces is really, really difficult. And the reason that is, is because we also simultaneously live in a world that is incredibly complex. So big systems, systems that are sort of the main institutions that drive the world, are complex. This is your healthcare.gov system. It's a total surprise that it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is, not, this is not like an architecture drawing. This is not some back-end system where every single thing that's exchanging data is drawn out here. These are literally the groups of people, the branches of government, the functional offices, the pieces of the puzzle that all have to communicate, collaborate, agree, move data through the system in order to deliver that healthcare.gov strategy. So if you're staring at a system like this, and most big important institutions are, and you're also staring at that other chart of how things have to change more quickly, the question on your mind is, how do big things react in a world that's changing really fast? How do they change in a way that makes sense at scale? And so that's a puzzle that we've been sort of obsessing on for the last couple of years. And what I wanted to do was share with you guys uh, what we found. We basically found that there are some systems out there that are simultaneously big and complex, but also quite adaptive and quite resilient and quite responsive. And so here they are. So basically, here's just three examples. There are dozens and dozens and dozens. And, and the Google search that you want to do if you really want to get into this is just start to look into complexity, complexity science, complex adaptive systems. There are hundreds of them out there, and I've picked three to highlight today. So first, ants. A hill of ants has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands and thousands of individual participants, individual agents that are working on behalf of that colony. And unlike a traditional system, the queen is not issuing orders. So there is no kind of today you get up and you go out and you start to you know, pick up food and forage or we need you to go clean up the mess that the rainstorm made last night. The ants all just wake up and somehow through some miracle of communication and complexity, they decide what to do and they do their work and they create structure. And what's amazing about it is they do things that are almost impossible to understand without imagining if there's some kind of communication. So they, if you actually study anthills, there might be 
the trash dump over here, the food supply over here, and the entrance to the colony over here, and they're equidistant as if an architect designed them. But there's no communication that talks about distances. There's no interaction like that. There's no architect ant that makes the decisions and tells everybody where to go. They just run around and they figure it out. And it turns out there's a set of simple rules about the way they work that allows that to happen. So then we look at the immune system. So everybody in here has an immune system that every day creates about 10 million new lymphocytes by randomly recombining the genes in your, in your uh, immune system. And so those lymphocytes go out, and their job is to go find pathogens that might be bad for you, things that are in your body or in the environment that, they, that are enemies. And so the 10 million go out, and eventually one or two of them comes upon a pathogen that it's a fit for. Their particular unique expression fits that pathogen. Maybe it's a flu. Maybe it's some other kind of virus or bacteria. And when it finds it, it connects and it binds. And when it binds at a high enough quantity, it releases a signal that, holy shit, we found We've got a winner here. And I like to call that product market fit. And so what happens is the, the lymphocyte has product market fit. It rushes back to the lymph nodes, which I like to think of as the VCs. And it's like, I have a winner here. And what it does is it gets funding and ends up replicating itself over and over and over again. It scales, right? So that's a system that basically has to deal with infinite complexity when it comes to the number of competitors that are going to try to F it up. Any number of things could come into your system that are not you. And it needs to be able to plan for that. So the way it does it is by creating this enormous variety of potentials and then doing a really good job of replicating and expressing the ones that, that find a fit. And then the last, and the one that's near and dear to a lot of our hearts, is just the internet. The internet, although people are trying their damnedest right now to do this, does not have a central regulatory body. It has some basic rules. It has some underpinning and some structure. But you can take a website down, and the other websites stay up. You can do a DOS attack, and people put it back together again. It is a living, breathing system that continually adapts and evolves and grows and changes and creates really powerful outcomes. So all three of these systems do a really good job of being very big, very important. They need to work. It's, it's all you know, pretty serious life or death stuff. And yet they do a really good job of adapting to circumstances as they change. And so what I want to do very quickly is just highlight, if we compare the old model the model that we're sort of taught in business school that you see in most 20th century organizations, that you see in 20th century government, to what these systems are suggesting we should be like, you really see a contrast. And that contrast starts to really speak to why the companies that we get excited about today, when you say, who's a company you're scared to compete with, those companies that come off the tongue tend to be organized and structured and going to market and doing their work in a way that feels a lot more like the ants and the lymphocytes and the internet, and a lot less like the institutions of our parents or our grandparents or their grandparents. And so I'll just run you very quickly uh, through, those, through those contrasts. So the first is that 20th century systems embrace planning, right? We know what's going to happen. The world doesn't change very fast, so I can make a 50-year plan. I can do a five-year plan for the business. I can tell you what's going to happen, and we can make a decision about that. So I'll build a handbook. The new model says, no, we have to embrace uncertainty. We don't know what we don't know. Things will change. So if we build a long plan and we go try to execute it, it's going to become useless. And it really boils down to, if you're taking a boat out on the ocean, do you want to steer once and then wait a year and pray? Or do you want to steer every minute? You, know, you want to have continuous steering. So embracing uncertainty means accepting that planning has a lot less value in a world where things change rapidly than it did in a world that stayed the same. And we need a new form of de-risking what we're doing that isn't just the 15-page you know, plan, that isn't a requirements document for a build that you know, is going to go into a waterfall process. The second is that old systems serve hierarchies. They say there's a command and control structure, there's a leader, there's an authority figure. We have to follow the rules. And the new systems serve networks. So they think about, what are we connecting? What networks can we leverage? What networks can we build? What networks can we serve and provide value to? Because networks are the systems upon which all this ad adaptivity needs to ultimately be built. So even if we try to construct a hierarchy, it's just going to break under the weight and growth and changing shape of those networks. And when you look at the businesses that are getting sort of that unicorn level funding these days, they're network focused. They're delivering value to a network. They're building a network. They're growing a new set of connections that weren't there before in order to unlock value 
And so that's something that, that uh, all these new responsive systems have to be mindful of. The third is that old systems centralize control. They want to put it in one place, the king. And the new systems distribute authority. They say, you know what, the new role of leader is to set the initial conditions, to set the game board, but then to let things unfold. Because you can't control it. You can't overgrip it. If you overgrip it, you stifle it. So you have to create a set of conditions that allow you to give authority and power and control over to the people at the edge that are actually getting the data, getting the feedback, getting the signal. And you're not having to play some game of translation between the three. So then we move on to enabling complication versus promoting simplicity. So because we're trying to take risk out of systems and they're so big and they're so complicated, we think the right reaction is to be complicated ourselves. So we need to have a whole bunch of different fun functions in a matrix. We have to have a playbook for everything. We have to have an answer for everything. It's on page 136, section C. If the customer tweets this, we tweet that. But in reality, it's a lot easier to just say, these are the simple rules. You know, when we heard from BarkBox, they were talking about, these are the simple rules. You got to love dogs. You got to care about the customer. You, you know, just work inside that box. Think about the customer first. Think about the type of person that you are, what you want to see. And if we have a little bit of chaos on the edges, that's fine. Because in general, the bullseye will be on track. And we'll get more volume. We'll get more adaptivity. We'll get more going on than we would in the other world. Another good example that I like a lot here is Zappos. You know, 13 core values. Go live them. Otherwise, figure it out. Right? They've got systems that allow people to act at the edge. The next one, and I think this is really interesting having, having heard from Greg, is moving from managing information, which I like to think of as sort of the spreadsheet model, to processing information, which is more like the algorithm model. Right? So if you move from one model to the next, you say, now we have to actually use this stuff. We can't just sit on 50 terabytes of data and not do anything with it. We have to actually process it. And I love this image of the, of the Google self-driving car because it shows the idea that the car is taking in all this data. And for all the data that it gets, it's all used to make sure that it doesn't run someone over. You know, There's no bit of data that they just ignore about a stop sign or a light or you know, someone walking in the intersection. Every bit gets used. It's, it's a really uh, holistic attitude. And when we think about it as processing, that means that we need to become much, much better at going out, sensing, collecting, storing, acting on data, right? We have to become better at the whole life cycle around the information that we have access to so that we can use it. And a lot of people that study these complex systems, when you talk to someone that watches ants all day, and there are people that do that, um, God bless them, they'll tell you they see those systems almost as computers, that essentially the job of the system is to go out, get data from the environment, process that data through a set of simple rules, and then deliver the change, the reaction, the outcome, the feedback mechanism that allows it to move forward. So in many ways, what we're trying to do is not just use computers, but become a computer. A, and I don't mean that technologically. I mean a system that computes, that gets information and processes it towards an outcome. Encouraging conformity is back to that old model. So we want to take everybody and put them, you know, square peg, round peg, doesn't matter, you're going in a round hole. We want to punch out a set of business school graduates that all have the same MBA with the same case study experience, and you're going to fill a role that has you know, been pre-planned for you to work for this period of time, and then you'll get promoted, and you move up this existing hierarchy, and everything is very, very rigidly defined. And so what we do is we want to snuff out difference. We want to snuff out anyone who's trying a different way or playing off book or tweeting something that's inappropriate, right? We want to carve out any difference. But in the new model, because you, know, you think back to those lymphocytes for a second, we actually, because we're trying to make sense of the world around us, because we're trying to change in the right direction at the right time, we actually want a lot more divergence, because the divergence gives us more signal, right? The more stuff we try, the more data we get, the more feedback we get, the more we can move in the direction of what works. And that doesn't mean we don't replicate and scale and find things that need to conform. But it means that that's a part of a process. First, we need 10 million lymphocytes. Then, when we find a winner, we can replicate it. And so there's a symbiosis between those ideas. And lastly, the systems that we've sort of seen in the past that are breaking down under the pressure of speed of change and the pressure of complexity generally try to sustain the status quo. So they have something to risk. Right? They have a reputation, they have a bankroll, they have a cash hoard, they have a set of customers, they have a market. 
They have a brand. And the, th the thought is, let's just keep what we have because it's valuable, because it's important, because it's something that the shareholder needs us to protect. And as a result, there's very little uh, aptitude for taking something that is different and doubling down on it, taking risks, going outside of that normal <laughs> profile. Whereas when we look at these complex systems, what they tend to do is they enable a lot of crossover, which another way to say that would be that they breed wins. So if you have a team that's really effective, figure out why, replicate it. You have a person that's effective, hire more people like them, hire their friends. If you have a program or a thing that you've done in an A-B test, if you're doing programmatic advertising, you want to double down on the things that are working and figure out how to spread them. And in an organization with a lot of people and a lot of departments and a lot of products, sometimes it's really hard to figure out what is it about this that's a win? What's, what is the bright spot here? Is it the product? Is it the people? Is it the combination? Is it the way we define the mission? So there's a science to learning how to do crossover that's very, very important. So Waze is a perfect example of a system that kind of brings all this stuff together. And if you guys have a moment uh, you know, later today and you're looking at Waze, think about it through this lens. What does it replicate? What does it allow? How does it use data and process it in a way that makes sense? How does it distribute authority to individual agents on the road? And why does it add up to an optimized and better system? This is an example of something that I've never shown anyone before because we're just now getting it going. But we've built uh, the first public way to measure this responsiveness, this sort of um, ability to change in the face of complexity. Uh, and we've got it at a site called Responsive Org where you can sign up, profile yourself, your team, your department, your company, and it'll come back at you with the results. So this is someone's results. I can't tell you who. But um, this is someone's results. And it gives you a really clear sense of where these ideas are really enacted within the culture and where they're not. And it starts to show us a little bit more about where we might want to dig. And the thesis is, and we're building this now as we get data from, from some of the companies that uh, are hot at the moment, the thesis is that the companies that are doing really well in the market are delivering on these ideas in a way that their competitors or their 20th century brethren are not. And so there actually is kind of a science to moving towards more of a complex adaptive system model within our organizations, within our cultures. And so I want to leave you uh, with one final thought, which is that when you're trying to do this, you can almost think about the tools in your arsenal, certainly people, certainly process, but also thinking about products, thinking about things that you use, whether that be a Percolate or a Google Analytics or an API or a GitHub or whatever. That's your stack. That's your responsive stack. And the more you leverage those things to create these kinds of phenomenon to allow information sharing, to allow you to process it, to allow you to create divergence and track it, to follow bright spots and replicate them, the more you can actually kind of drive an outcome that makes you someone that would score really highly in this idea of a complex adaptive system, a responsive organization. So it's very early days for this stuff, but we're pretty excited about what it's telling us about what the future might be. And uh, I'm happy to talk about it with you all later. Thanks.